Okay, so the suggestion is that the historic name uh, Dixie uh, could be interpreted as coming from a person, uh, a Miwok person, Mary Dixie. Um, so that's the proposed one of the proposals um, for either maintaining the name or uh, slightly repurposing it by uh, recalling the first name, the first word of the name, uh, this supposed Miwok lady or actual Miwok late person, um, Mary Dixie. Um, so along those lines of argument, um, let's go back in time and let's imagine this Miwok family uh, and this baby Miwok girl is born in some situation, in some place. And at some point in her life, it's not clear when, um, she's given this name. I don't know if she was given this name as a child, or as an adult, or when it happened. Um, so let's look specifically at the name given to this supposed Miwok human person. Um, the name is, consists, consists of the words Mary and Dixie. Um, so I, I think we have in the record an approximate time that this woman lived, and I'll, well, I'll reference that in the video. I don't have it in front of me. Um, so whenever that was, she supplied, you know, this, this, these two words are applied to her. These two um, pretty much Christian Southern words. You know, the first one, Mary. Uh, the obvious reference is the the mother of Jesus. That's the most obvious reference. Uh, there there are other references. There there are uh, several <clears throat> references to Mary in the context of enlightenment and and, and also in. Uh, in in, the, in art history, you know, there, there are Marys that, that they typically are associated with beauty and grace and, you know, Mary. There's, you know, virginal behavior. There's, there's more than one Mary out there, right? But the point is, <clears throat> neither, neither word, neither Mary, neither word, neither the word Mary nor the word Dixie has anything to do with supposed Miwok culture. They aren't Miwok words. Um, they're not Miwok. So, okay, the supposed or actual supposedly Miwok human has these two non-Miwok words applied to her. Mary and Dixie. The second word, Dixie, pretty much only has a connotation specific to the Southern Confederate States, mostly in the last 200 years related to the Civil War. That's pretty much the dominant reading to, I would say, 95% of humans on Earth. Uh, Dixie. That Dixie. Um, there are other readings of Dixie, but, you know, they are way lesser in significance. You know, the French term for ten, uh, you know, it's whatever. There's other readings, but 95% of humans on planet Earth think that the word Dixie means the southern confederate states in the United States mostly during the Civil War era, specific to the issue of whether or not we should maintain slavery as a peculiar institution, and some of the states were down for that, and other states said, no, the Union's more important than maintaining your peculiar institution of enslaving people. Okay, so, this supposed Miwok person has a name that means 
virginal Mother Mary and slavery. So the proposal by the maintain the name folks is suggesting that this name is somehow so honorific and heroic and complementary to a specific Miwok human that we should maintain it, and not just maintain it, we should hold it up to our children forever as this heroic name of honor that was glued to this mythical native person. Okay, how were names glued to native people in the United States? There are at least two plausible explanations without a whole lot of research. One scenario was missionaries arrived and occupied an area that was historically migratory Native American territory. Like, for example, the entire state of Nevada was migratory Native American territory before it was formulated during the Civil War as a Union state. 19, you know, 1864. Um, so, that's one way, is missionaries, typically white, male, Christian-based missionaries, showed up, saw the natives, made sure they got religion, and as a uh, rite of passage, bestowed upon the compliant natives these new names. And the names represented their, their paradigm. You know, they brought the names with them like uh, imported plants. Um, you know, names like Mary, and Joseph, and Elizabeth, and you know, whatever. Christian white names sub supplanted onto these lucky natives, right? So that's one way you get a name. Um, that's maybe a slightly gentle one. A less gentle one is sometimes these same guys, white, male, property grabbers. They were under the paradigm of Western expansion and, you know, uh, manifest, manifest destiny. So they're spreading their seed across the United States fast as possible, as much as land as you can grab, it's yours. You can grab it, hold it, and take care of it, it's yours. So that's the paradigm. Those guys showed up in what was migratory Native American bliss, and the compliant Indians were rewarded with these great new names, like Mary, and the non-compliant Indians were punished. And if you want to check out how they were punished, there's a lot of books about that and movies, and they're all pretty awful. So basically they were punished in a scenario that devolved into genocide. But before that happened, they were merely enslaved. So when a white Christian, typically land-grabbing motherfucker, shows up and enslaves these poor people, he gets the naming rights, just like Donald Trump gets the naming rights, right? So he stuck Trump on it, but in this case, he stuck Dixie on it. He stuck Dixie on a woman. So she gets the lucky name Mary and Dixie. Who knows how old she was, but I'm thinking she was maybe a teenager or an adult. So she was rewarded with this lucky new name for being a compliant Indian. Now does that scenario, do either of those scenarios, cause the names Mary and Dixie to rise to the heroic level of reward? 
Like, should we reward our children with this name stuck on their soccer shirts forever and ever? Because of this heroic story of A, slavery of Native Americans, or B, occupy, occupation and forced religious compliance of Native Americans. Either of those scenarios is pretty freaking embarrassing and traumatic, certainly to Native Americans, but also to black Americans. You ask a black person what the word Dixie means to them, they have a pretty good idea. They don't need it spelled out much further. It's a code word. It's like, forget that. Forget this place. So the interesting aside to this is it appears to our limited research of the last several months with numerous academics that the real estate people, um, they seem to have used this imported terminology from the Confederacy as a dog whistle. And that dog whistle is, is folded into the real estate marketing information to anyone who reads. And so you see that word Dixie 